Every once in a while, I discover a little known but incredibly fascinating person living in our region. Today's show has one of these finds. Stay with us and find out who next on Lakeshore Focus. Programming is supported by NIPSCO. Today's young minds are constantly reimagining what our world will be like tomorrow. That's why NIPSCO is upgrading its infrastructure now, so we're ready for whatever comes next. More information at nipsco.com slash future. Welcome again to Lakeshore Focus, a weekly show highlighting the key issues, important events, and interesting people in our region. I'm Keith Kirkpatrick. I'm going to start this program with a quiz. What do a laser, submarine detection, the atomic clock, and GPS have in common? The answer is our guest today. Please meet Alan Berman, the former director of the Naval Research Laboratory and former advisor to the National Security Council as we learn about his truly interesting life. So, glad to have you on the show. Thank you, sir. It took a little talking to get you on, though, didn't it? It did. <laughs> so, why were you so reluctant to really want to do this? Well, I'm a historic artifact <laughs> by contemporary standards. Uh, I left the laboratory 35 years ago, roughly, and uh, since then, I've done many things, but it's ancient history, and at the age of 90, I tend to be uh, living very quietly and peacefully all alone. How long were you the director of the National, of the Naval Research, Research Laboratory? Laboratory. Uh, it was about 15 years. Okay, and that's the biggest research laboratory for the government? Uh, for the Department of Defense, yes. Okay, that's the biggest Department of Defense one. Yes. Uh, how many people work there? At the time, there were about 5,000. We had about, oh, 1,150 PhD types, about 2,500 engineers, and the rest were technicians and support staff. That, the that, that's group be is a, smaller today. That's got to be a rough group to kind of guide, isn't it? That many educated people? Well, uh, they are people that know what they're doing, presumably, or they wouldn't be there. And they are people that are striving to accomplish their goals. Uh, I may or may not have disagreed with them on per things, but normally you could work things out because we were aiming at a common goal. So you, I'm gonna back up on your history a little bit. I think you were, you were in the Navy and then you started doing research in 1946 or something like that? No, no, I, got, I was in World War II as a kid. I was at the age of 18, I was drafted in the Army. And when I got out of the Army at 20, I was started graduate school at, in physics at Columbia University. Uh, the graduate school was just one of the more heady and experiences I've ever had of the faculty, postdocs, and graduate students. There were 18 of us that eventually got Nobel Prizes. I didn't. I was the class failure. <laughs> one of my classmates, Harold Brown, became Secretary of Defense. Bob Frosch was head of NASA and uh, Frank Press was the science advisor for President Carter. After I got out, got my doctorate, I worked for the Navy for 15 years at Columbia before going to, uh, being selected to be director of the research at NRL. So I, I uh, teased our audience with something about the atomic clock, and I think this was some, one of your first projects. Was that during grad school? Yes. Uh, I started grad school supported by the GI Bill of Rights, but I was ran out of money after a few years, so I took a job as a technician working for Professor Robbie, who was a Nobel laureate and the real, tr really the father of physics in the United States. And one day, when I was covered with grease and working and rather disreputable looking, back tied over. I looked up and there into the laboratory came Dwight Eisenhower, the dean, of, uh, the provost of the university and Professor Robby. And as a, he was president of Columbia University at the time. 
And as, the, as generals do when they inspect, said something like, what are you doing, young man? And I blurted out at some sort of explanation. He said, who's paying for all this equipment? And I said, I don't know, sir. I think the Navy. And he said, what, and the Navy paying for this? What possible military use is there? My professor said, there's no use. This is pure research, and went out. It's amazing how wrong both of them were. Today, every military operation is essentially keyed by time standards, things like GPS, digital communication, data transfer. And this was the atomic clock you were working yes, on, right? Yes, that was the very first one. Was that, was that your invention, or were you just like kind of following oh, no, the no. design? Oh, no, no. I was a technician. Okay. I was a 23-year-old kid uh, working for my boss, who was the Nobel laureate. The device is actually in the Smithsonian now. Wow. So, so you, you told me a similar story about about GPS and when you were there, the, about the bombings in Vietnam. And uh, could you share that story a little bit? Oh yeah. I came to uh, NRL in uh, about 1967, and it was the height of the Vietnam War. And as everyone knows, it was going very very badly. I was called in one day by the Deputy Secretary of Defense for Research and Engineering, along with some others, and he said, look, we have dropped more bombs on Vietnam than we did on Western Europe in World War II. Most of them not only hit a military objective, but ended up hitting innocent civilians, which is both wrong and not helping the United States one bit. And we analyzed the problems. One of the problems was the planes didn't know where they were, and two, they didn't know where the target was, and three, they had no way of guiding a dumb bomb to a target whose location they didn't know from a plane whose location they didn't know. So I was assigned the problem, or NRL was assigned the problem, of locating things on the planet. And uh, I went back to NRL, called in people who knew about the atomic clocks of, the, of 1967, which were very different than mine of 52 or 48, uh, people that knew how to build satellites, uh, people that could handle the communication. And that was the birth of GPS. Now, it's obviously improved vastly since then to the point that you have it in the little gadget you hold in your pocket. And it knows where you are. It knows where you are, et cetera. Okay, so part of that too, so that was the GPS system that, mm -hmm. that kind of came up. Were there some other major findings at that same time for you? Well, uh, knowing how to locate anything is a very important thing. When my children were very little and they, their teeth came out as they lost their baby teeth, we used to say the tooth fairy would give them a quarter under their pillow. I remember once one of my children triumphantly ran out of the house as he saw me coming home and dropped the tooth in the grass. I had to recover it, but trying to find a tooth, an infant's tooth, in a square yard of grass was about as difficult as finding a submar sunken submarine in a, say, 10 square mile area, would you know? It is amazing how difficult it is to find and locate things without we, proper instrumentation. Well, you talked about this GPS system, which means that you guys are heavily involved in launching and putting up a lot of satellites, then I take it. Yes, NRL, as a matter of fact, launched the first successful American satellite. At I don't remember the number now or what it is, but I said by the time I had left, we had launched 46 of them of all sorts, including those that were the precursors for GPS, plus satellites that were surveillance satellites, uh, communication satellites. The first satellite communication systems were made by NRL. So a lot of what you were working on was detection and identification. And I, th I think also you were involved in some sort of submarine detection since you were with the Navy. 
I assume they were wanting to figure out where submarines were also under the water. That was a very high priority subject for them. When I left graduate school, I took what I thought was a summer job before I went, was going to get an academic position in a laboratory that was funded by the Navy with the intent of improving detection systems uh, so that the Navy could detect Soviet submarines at the time, which were a major concern. I stayed there 15 years, and the results of our research at that little laboratory resulted in a major operational submarine surveillance system that allowed the Navy to track pretty much all sub Soviet submarines. So this uh, is all during the Cold War, particularly, This was right? during the Cold War era. So and we did the research, and it was a huge system. It would probably, I don't know the total cost, but I would guess it in modern money would be the cost of three to five billion dollars and probably had somewhere 10 to 50,000 people employed in it at any given time. Wow. So during this time, you, you were also an, uh, an advisor to the National Security Council, so you had some interaction with some of the presidents at the time. So interesting story about bumping into one of them or being, maybe, maybe you got called on the carpet, I don't know. Well, we're doing something wrong. I when you're running a large organization with lots of uh, programs going on, you're bound to make mistakes or somebody with you, working with you, is bound to. Uh, the presidents of the United States were rather interesting that I met. Nixon, whenever I met him, was a rather surly and unpleasant type and didn't seem to have patience to listen to anything. One of my difficulties was that I was a close friend of all of the president's science advisors from uh, Ed David, who worked for Nixon, through, uh, let's say, Frank Press, who worked for, uh, then uh, Jay Keyworth, who finally worked for Reagan. Uh, the trouble was occasionally I'd get called up at night at dinner table by one of the, the president's science advisor and said, the president would like you too. <laughs> and suddenly I was off on a long and difficult study about something or other. Now, is this during social times at, at activities in D.C.? Is, it, is this during the party? Well, no, this is occasionally at home at... Uh, okay. In other words, a lot of, most saddle of business in D.C., other than the formal business, was done in what was called the cocktail party circuit. That is, if somebody in the British embassy wanted to visit somebody at NRL, they had to send a request through their ambassador to the American State Department who would send it down this director, uh, the uh, uh, like an undersecretary? Secretary, no, the no, Secretary of Defense, then the Unders Deputy, and eventually it would come to me. There about It was a seven-layer process, and if, God forbid, somebody had filled out a form for request improperly, nothing would ever happen. So what people tended to do was have parties and invite you over. Eventually, I became fairly socially friendly with people from foreign embassies and Japanese, Israeli, Italian, English, Canadian, Who was the most interesting person? You probably met so many interesting people, but just one that pops in your head. A couple of people that were just, just, it was kind of fascinating to meet them. Well, at one of these parties, I met Golden Mayur, which the Israeli prime minister, she was a pretty impressive woman. Uh, There were various senior English uh, scientists, engineers, and politicians that come to mind that were also fascinating to work with and meet. I was invited to uh, spend a year working in England before in, in the early 1950s. In fact, my oldest daughter was born while I was working 
in a laboratory in Great Britain. Wow. So we, we mentioned several things in the, in the opening of the show. One was also you were, had some involvement with the development of the laser. Yes, indeed, I did. The development of the laser was fascinating. It happened in three places. One in Russia, a man named uh, Prokhorov, uh, Baz and a colleague Bazov invented it. And two, it, invented, it was invented in two contigu independently in two contiguous rooms on the ninth floor of Pupin Hall at Columbia University. In other words, in room 907, um, Professor Towns and his brother-in-law are uh, work together. And in the room that I was in, 905, I worked, I was doing my thesis, and my laboratory assistant, a man named Gordon Gould, also invented the laser. How does that and there happen? was about an there was an eight inch wall between the two of us, but the two groups never uh, Art Scholo was a very good friend of mine, as was Towns, and so was uh, Gordon Gould. Gould's invention of the laser came about as a follow-up from my PhD thesis. I had worked on a certain atomic state in an oddball atom, thallium, and when it was time for me to go and him to start his thesis, they asked him to do uh, something that was about 10 million times harder than what I did. So we sat down and said, how could you do it? And he said, well, the only thing you could do is get it more atoms in an excited state by enhanced radiation. So I, with that, he started working on it and was quite successful. At some point, he decided that, uh, yes, it was, would be a laser if you did that. And he went to a, wrote it up in his lab book and wrote, went to a local candy store and had it notarized by the proprietor of the candy store, a thing which at any course in patent law would tell you not to do, but that's not the end of that. About a year later, I came home from a long trip at sea and he invited me and my wife over to play bridge with him and his wife. He asked me, I asked him how his research was going, and he showed me his plans for the laser. Well, he went on working on it, as did uh, Sholo and Charlie Towns. Uh, Towns got a uh, Nobel Prize for inventing the laser, along with the two Russians. But Gordon Gould was ordered, also given the patent in American courts in eight, 1987. And since I was the first person that saw the notebook, they were in a patent fight that went on for 30 years, I was involved in litigation for 30 years wow. between the 1950s to 1987. So in this long career that you've had, what is the one thing that you feel like was kind of, this was my, I really feel good about this accomplishment? Well, certainly GPS, I think, has been a wonderful thing. Not only is it good for you when you're driving in your car and it like tells you what street to go, but what it has done is, if I may say, I think it has made war a little less cruel. In other words, nowadays, when a bomb or a missile is directed somewhere, it generally goes where it go, is supposed to go or where somebody wants it to. Occasionally weapons, of course, are backed up or don't go there, do it right. But the thing is that the sort of carpet bombing that you had in World War II or Vietnam, Vietnam that was in many ways terribly cruel and insensitive now no longer happen, at least the United States doesn't do it, and we aim at military targets. So I think that's something I feel very, very good about. You, you've talked about all these people who are Nobel, Nobel laureates, and then you said I was kind of the failure of the group, but you've received some recognition for some things you've done. Is there some recognition that you just felt really pretty good about, that at least you got patted on the back or told you it did a good job? Well, I... 
receive letters from three presidents tell, thanking me for what I've done. And I received a, the Department of Defense Distinguished Service Award, which is roughly equivalent to the Congress, civilian version of the, Congress, of the Congressional Medal of Honor from the Secretary of Defense. The other thing was that when President Carter came in, he decided to have a <clears throat> new system of recognition of senior civil servants. And he gave award, he set out to have awards for those who had performed particularly well. And there was a public law passed about it. And because my name begins with B and they give out awards alphabetically, I was the first person in the United States to ever get the award of <laughs> Distinguished Senior Executive. That's, pre that's pretty cool. So, But I think it was only because of the alphabetization. You, you think was, that was the only reason? Yeah. I, I, I bet it might have been more than that. But if there was one piece, we're down to a couple minutes here, if just something you've kind of learned in your career about working with people or just about the world, I mean, what's a piece of wisdom you would share with our viewers? Well. The, way, the point is, nothing comes easily. Or if you are going to have jobs and do work you, and pursue these intricate and extremely difficult or esoteric problems, you have to work hard. I used to get to my desk every morning by 6.30 a.m. and well, I was lucky if I got home by 7 p.m. But the main point was to know your people, know what they're doing, know what their motivation is, and speak to them at some point on a non-confrontational basis. In large organizations, you never see your boss unless he's angry with you or you want something from him, or you're angry with him. Uh, so the thing you want is an arrangement whereby you meet somebody on a fairly neutral basis and really try to talk to them to understand what they are doing, why they're doing it, and what their objectives are. Well, I, and I had breakfast with everybody, uh, one at a time, at least at a certain level in the organization, about three levels down. Uh, every morning with a different one and the cycle repeated every 88 days. Well, I appreciate you being on the show. I appreciate the wisdom you've shared and the accomplishments. It's been really great. And I know you've told me some other stories, but since we, I've learned that you live in my neighborhood, I hope that you haven't told me something that's going to, you know, you'll have to say, he knows more than he should, you know, and, and <laughs> I, the CIA shows up one day or something. But anyway, thank you for being on the show. I really appreciate well, it. Thank you for having me. You bet. My guest today reminded me that any great occurrence, whether a discovery, invention, or improvement, is the sum of the efforts made by many. You probably have to add to that equation the impact of time, place, and conditions. It's rather complex. I want to focus on the work of the many, even though we often attribute the success to one person, or perhaps a pair. So why does one person or a duo receive the credit? when there were so many who worked behind the scenes to bring about the advancement? I will answer that question with a set of questions. Who was the leader? Who accepted the responsibility? Who owned the challenge? Who took the risk? When you can answer those questions, you will determine the name that goes with the project. I'm not taking away from the efforts made by the many who supported, assisted, and aided. One of them may have even had the original idea or seed which sprouted into full bloom. Without this crew of a few, or a cast of thousands, it would not have happened. Often one of these people, identified as the named associate with the great outcome, is honored. It is so refreshing when you hear that person share the glory with his or her team. In addition, appreciation is heaped upon that supporting cast for all they have contributed. Yes, I know just about everyone does it, 
But when the thank yous occur and the specific people are identified for what they have done, you can tell who is sincerely sharing the limelight and who is just saying the words. I have two images in mind to demonstrate both scenarios. The first is a picture of a group of people with one in the middle holding the award, beaming, and the team surrounding has facial expressions of, why am I here? I'll be glad when the big jerk moves on and yeah, 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 look who gets all the attention. The second has a similar arrangement, but the people in the picture appear to be excited, engaged, and are looking at the leader with faces of admiration and appreciation. The next time you get to be in a photo like that, I hope you are in the second one. As always, I want to hear from you. We welcome your comments and thoughts about the content of this program. I particularly would like to know what you, more you would have liked to have heard from our guest today. You can email us at focus at lakeshorepublicmedia.org or reach us on our website. If you have an idea for a topic or specific guest for Lakeshore Focus, send that suggestion to me. We are always looking for interesting content. Join us next week for another Lakeshore Focus. Until then, I'm Keith Kirkpatrick saying, make a positive difference in our world today. Programming is supported by NIPSCO. Today's young minds are constantly reimagining what our world will be like tomorrow. That's why NIPSCO is upgrading its infrastructure now, so we're ready for whatever comes next. More information at nipsco.com future.